All right, now we've got uh, part two, day five of uh, the closing arguments. And I wanted to see more fire and passion out of the prosecution in those closing arguments. He, uh, he did all right. Again, I wanted him to hammer home Dr. Pickett's point of why he came to his conclusions of her being diabolical, her being callous, her making executive functions, executive thought processes by going and getting specific things, going to specific places in the home to get a specific item. When Pickett was on, I was on the edge of my seat. And it it really affirmed to me that, wow, she, she wasn't insane. Because that's the whole premise of the defense's case, is that she's insane, she blacked out, she hears voices. Okay? So, but, it was okay. I mean, they played the video. He did mention some of Pickett's stuff, but I, I thought he could have hammered it home a little bit. Maybe he didn't need to. But again, it's the last thing they're going to hear from the prosecution before they go back to deliberate. And now, uh, I'm not going to do a whole long of an intro of this. Uh, but again, just I wanted to see some more passion. Hammering at home. Look at her. She is before he played the video. The prosecution did play the video, starting at the point where Carly looks and then goes back to Ashley's side of the house and gets the the gun. Before he played that, I wanted him to remind them of what Pickett had said in testimony, of how calculating she was, how deliberate she was in her thought process. I mean, to me, that was. That's what brought it home to me, listening to the testimony for the first time. I was like, whoa, it was like a bomb. It was so intense. And again, I said in the last video, if you haven't seen Pickett's testimony, you're interested in trials, go watch his testimony. I mean, it was so good. It was so good. And go watch Clark's testimony. Go watch all of Dr. Clark's testimony because the whole defense rested on Dr. Clark. To me. And of course Pickett said he didn't take much stock in Dr. Clark's evaluation. Because it was Carly said all of these things after the murder. So it's really important. And of course the prosecution in its opening. I'm, I'm sorry in his closing. He's you know he's going over some of the jury instructions. And he's saying you know you have to have common sense. And it. It is clear common sense that a layman such as myself could pick up on the two different versions of the battle of the the forensic psychiatrists uh, of what each of them are saying and how I can understand between the two. Now, the defense is fixing to get on. It's their closing. It's their turn. I haven't seen this. What are they going to do? They've got they've got the TV up. Are they going to play the video? They shouldn't. I mean, because that play, what are they going to play? What are they going to say? How are they going to wrap this up to be the last words of the defense in the jury's ear? To sway them, convince them beyond a reasonable doubt that she was insane. She blacked out when she took the dogs out. She came to when she was in the sewer pipe. She made cow Guys, she was so calculated. She picks up her mother's phone and pretends she's her mother, but she's blacked out. She's detached. It's too much. I think it's it it's just too much. I to me, I think the jury's already made their mind up. I don't know. I'm speculating. 
Again, I haven't seen this. Look, we're only at 10 minutes from an hour into this 5 hour and 45 minute day 5. They each get 40 minutes apiece, so it's the defense's turn. I don't know how long did the date. I don't even know how long the jury deliberated. I am, I am curious to see. It was it that quick? I don't know. I mean, I do know the trial's over. Don't misunderstand. I do know the trial's over. I know what the verdict is, but I didn't see the video of if it's this one of of the verdict. I don't know. I wanted I wanted a fresh view. I wanted to see all the evidence. I wanted to see everything. I wanted to see the the prosecution's closing, the the defense's closing. I wanted to see it all straight through how this is playing out because I like trials and this trial fascinated me. And it fascinated a lot of people. Now did it get the popularity of uh of Johnny Depp? No. But the battle between the two uh, forensic psychiatrists was just as good. It's the it's the Johnny Depp trial in the Amber Heard. It, I I thought so. If not better, it was so good. Uh, Pickett was amazing, and the defense trying to discredit him because he didn't have the experience that Clark did was a dumpster fire, epic fail, in my opinion. Pickett's first time up ever testifying in a case such as this, he was a brilliant. Again, I'm going to say, if you haven't seen his testimony, you're just tuning in to this trial for the first time, which could be possible because people have lives and they're busy and they don't always have time to sit and watch through this stuff. But I broke this trial down from day one. And I'm going to break it down to the end. So if, if you're just tuning in, go. You, you're welcome to go. I have a playlist that's Carly Griggs Trial. And you can go through and pick out which ones you want to see on each day. Um, or go to Law and Crime. Uh, Court TV has it as well. Now, Court TV at first had a lot of bad audio problems. Um in the opening statement, so I had to switch to law and crime because the audio was better. Now, on day uh, day four, there was a lot of lag and some glitchiness, but I, I don't know why. But it, it's still, you can still hear all the testimony. It does, the screen freezes up, but you could still hear the audio. So there was some glitchy there. But other than that, it, it, it played through well enough for you to... To get the information. Okay, let's dive into this and see what the defense is going to do. Their last stand. The defense's last stand to persuade this jury that Carly was insane at the time of the murder. Oh, wow. I, I'm surprised that she's doing it. I stopped it for just a moment. I, I thought it was going to be the guy because she did the opening. And now she's going to follow up with the closing. Now, I know with the the uh, prosecution, the I forgot her name, the, the, the prosecuting lady, she did the opening and then the guy, her partner, did, did the closing. So I was assuming that, that they were going to switch it up with the, with this, but here we go. We begin. Yes, sir. Good morning. I know it's been a long week for all of you guys, uh, and I know you're tired of coming here every day. But I want to take a minute and talk about why the state has the burden of proof that they have, the highest burden of proof that our law allows, which is beyond a reasonable doubt. A lot of people think that having that high of a burden is there because it's supposed to protect the defendants in criminal cases. But in fact, I think it protects the jurors just the same, if not more, than it does the defendant because making the state prove every element of their case beyond a reasonable doubt is what is going to keep each of you from waking up in the middle of the night. Oh, 
Oh my God. The decisions that you make today will not just affect Carly Gregg, it will affect her entire family. And it's a heavy burden to carry. So I want to take a few minutes and talk about the truth. The truth is rarely pure and never simple. That's what Oscar Wilde said. Let's talk about what is undisputed in this case. It is undisputed that Carly loved her mom. You never heard the testimony of one person in this case who said otherwise. It's undisputed that Carly had no history of violence prior to March 19th. Nothing you heard. There is no evidence that tells you otherwise. It's undisputed that Carly Gregg loved her stepdad. In fact, he was the only dad she really ever had. No one told you otherwise. It's undisputed that Carly Gregg believed her father had a mental illness, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Carly was afraid of her dad. She knew he was an unsuccessful man. She knew he was abusive. She didn't like being around him. She didn't want to be like him. It's also undisputed that that's something Carly worried about all the time because that's something her mom worried about all the time. Her mom frequently worried that Carly was going to end up with the same mental illnesses that her dad had because they're hereditary. It is undisputed that Carly had been experiencing serious mental health issues for quite some time prior to the events of March 19th. She had bulimia for two years. She had intrusive thoughts. She had racing thoughts. She had engaged in self-harm behaviors. Carly had anxiety. She had been diagnosed with a major depressive disorder and she had developed trouble sleeping four months prior to March 19th. Moreover, we have her journal entry from April 7th of 2023 in which she writes down, do I have schizophrenia? We have Carly's other journal entries prior to March 19th, including her journal entry on March 12th, which you'll have back there in there with you. And I implore you to read in which Carly writes down and says, am I having a psychotic break? Talking about the voices in her head. We heard the testimony of SK and that testimony came out on cross-examination, not with me on direct, but with the prosecutor on cross that yes, Carly did in fact tell somebody prior to March 19th that she'd been hearing voices in her head. And who did she tell? The person she was most likely to tell her very best friend, who told us that they told each other everything. Now, it is also undisputed that Carly's mental health issues worsened by December of 2023 to the point that her parents sought medical intervention and put her in counseling and got her on an antidepressant. And I wanna take a minute and break that decision down because we've spent a lot of time in this case talking about Carly and her mom and how much they loved each other. But I want to break down the decision a mom is making to put her child on an antidepressant at that point. What did we know about Ashley Smiley? That she was an incredibly loving mother. Her world revolved around Carly. What Michael just told you was true. Carly was the love of her mother's life. We also know that Carly's mom was overprotective and understandably so because she had lost a child. Carly was the only child she had left. Do you honestly believe that loving, overprotective mother would make a decision to put her child on an antidepressant medication when she herself had had horrible side effects when placed on Prozac? She'd become suicidal. Do you think that mother would have taken any risk with her child, the only child she had left, knowing how serious those risks were, when she decided to put her 14-year-old on an antidepressant medication? No, of course she wouldn't. 
That tells you everything you need to know about the serious issues Carly was having, whether her parents wanted to admit it, whether Carly wanted to admit it or not. You can't tell me Ashley Smiley, as loving and protective as she was, would have taken that risk with Carly if it wasn't required. Now, knowing all this, it's also undisputed by Rebecca Kirk, the only medical professional who spent more than a day with Carly that you heard from in this case, who had treated Carly from January of 2024 to March of 2024, a three month period of time that Carly was a sweet, gifted child with no history of violence. Ms. Kirk also called the, the taking the knife to school incident much ado about nothing. She told us that it was evident that Carly loved her mom, wanted to please her mom, and was worried about stressing her mom out to the point that Carly walked on eggshells trying not to upset her mom. She told us a story about how at one point Carly saw her mom having to grade a bunch of tests, being stressed out, and Carly wanted to help. So she asked her mom if she could help her grade the test. And when Ashley snapped back, which is something parents sometimes do when they're stressed out and a child catches you at the wrong moment, you know, that hurt Carly's feelings so much, you know, that that was the only thing that Rebecca Kirk could pull out of her when she was trying to get Carly to open up about traumatic experiences she had had. Just having a mom snap at you was traumatic to Carly. How could Carly tell her mom she was experiencing the same mental health issues that her dad had? How could any 14 year old? It's also undisputed from Ms. Kirk herself that she knew there was more going on with Carly than Carly was disclosing. And she worked very hard at that last session trying to pull it out of Carly to the point that she thought maybe I should refer them to somebody else because there's more here than I can get to. We've heard the testimony of Carly's stepfather who has no reason to defend this child. It's not his biological child. He was very much in love with his wife. They were still in the honeymoon phase. You heard him on that 911 call. That was a man in shock and grief and in pain. You heard his testimony about feeling intimidated regarding his testimony in this case. But despite all of that, he has continued to tell the truth consistently from March 19th until his testimony in this courtroom today. And he continues to stand by Carly to this day and support her. And he said, yeah, I've noticed that Carly was experiencing memory lapses in the fall of 2023. It was bizarre. I noticed that Carly was losing track of time. It was bizarre. They knew Carly wasn't able to sleep. They were worried about how much melatonin she was taking to try to sleep at night. We heard from Dr. Pickett how that all correlates with bipolar disorder. It is undisputed from the testimony of the minors who testified in this courtroom today, uh, this week, that Carly had only started smoking marijuana in February. It is also undisputed by the testimony in this case and the records we put in evidence from Vital Corps, which you'll have back there with you, and I hope you'll look at, that it was only after Carly was finally put on Abilify, an antipsychotic medication that the voices stopped and her mental health issues decreased. The crying spells, the depression, the low lows. Only after the antipsychotic medication. And why? Well, we heard from the medical professionals why. In the words of Dr. Clark, when you have a child experiencing psychotic issues, you have to stabilize their mood before an antidepressant can be effective. And if you don't stabilize their mood, 
then the antidepressant can do more harm than good. And that's exactly what happened to Carly Gregg on March 19th. We heard the video from the garage cam of Heath Smiley coming home on March 19th. We heard those feral screams that Carly made the whole time. And we heard the testimony of Mr. Smiley that he was so convinced by the state of terror Carly was in that after she left that house and he was wounded and bleeding, he walked around the house with the handgun looking for the intruder that he believed was there based on the state of terror Carly was in. We heard the screams. You can't fake that. You can't make that terror up. Carly has consistently reported to everyone that the last thing she remembered on March 19th was taking the dogs out and the next thing she remembered was crawling through a sewer filled with water. And I personally believe that it was the cold water that brought Carly back out of it and back to herself, the shock of it. The state would have you believe that Carly intended to kill her mom on March 19th when Carly didn't even know during the evaluations that her friends had sought to intervene because they believed that what they saw from Carly was due to marijuana use that started in February rather than symptoms of a mental illness that they could not know about. But that story just doesn't track. Because for the genius kid that Carly has been repeatedly described as, don't you think she would have known if she intended to do what she did on March 19th, where the camera was in the kitchen, and that she ought to take it down before it films her doing everything she did? Because I didn't make a 30 on my ACT, but I would have known to do that. That doesn't sound like the actions of a smart kid who was intending to do anything. If Carly intended to kill her mom because her mom found out she was smoking pot, then why wouldn't she have left the house after she killed her mom? Why not run then? Why call all of her good friends asking for help, terrified, crying, saying she couldn't tell them what happened? Why text her stepdad anything? Why wait in the house? And what did her stepdad have to do with anything? He didn't know about the marijuana usage. He didn't have any skin in that game. It doesn't make sense. And the state can't tell you why she did any of those things. But they have to prove it to you beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, no one, not her stepdad, not her counselors, not Dr. Clark, who was teaching psychiatry at Harvard while Dr. Pickett was still in medical school, believed that Carly was a sociopath or a psychopath, even Dr. Pickett said that was going too far. The state put on the testimony of B.W., who is the only person who told us anything about Carly making a statement about shooting her mom and she had three more for her stepdad. Um, I didn't hear that statement from the law enforcement officers that interviewed her. I heard it from the prosecutor. But I also heard from the prosecutor that B.W. was a little bit of an unreliable witness because she answered the first question of where did Carly get marijuana from? I don't know. To have to answer immediately with the follow-up question, well, isn't it true that, that you bought it and gave it to her? Yeah, that's true. So that tells us right there we've got a little bit of an unreliable witness. Now, we also had Dr. Pickett who gave us his opinion. But Dr. Pickett admitted that he had no experience whatsoever in the field of child and adolescent psychiatry. He had never evaluated a child before Carly. He had never testified in a criminal case before and he had never qualified as an expert before in anything, in any criminal case before this one. So I have a hard time accepting Dr. Pickett's opinion that especially when he is discounting the diagnosis of a doctor who diagnosed Carly's father with bipolar disorder. When, and the reason that Dr. Pickett told us that he discounted this other doctor's diagnosis was because that doctor had only seen Kevin Gregg three times 
Well, Dr. Pickett saw him zero times, but yet he's able to undiagnose him and re-diagnose him? I mean, if Dr. Pickett can diagnose or undiagnose someone without ever seeing them, he's going to have a hell of a career. And even though Dr. Pickett denied having a, a preconceived bias going into this case, I couldn't help but realize he had memorized all the medication that Kevin Gregg was on that he believed contributed to Kevin Gregg just being a drug addict, but he somehow missed the three antipsychotic medications that Kevin Gregg had been on. That Mr. Gregg had been prescribed for his bipolar disorder and possibly schizophrenia. But you know what? Those facts didn't fit his story. So, no need to include them. And I actually couldn't stop thinking about that. Why was it that he memorized the medications he believed were easy for people to abuse and become addicted to, but just couldn't remember at all the three antipsychotic medications that Mr. Gregg was on at the same time that stood out to me, who's not a doctor and who doesn't have training in this field. I had to go Google those drugs to learn they were antipsychotics. And then I realized when I was looking at Dr. Pickett's CV, which we also put into evidence, and I hope you look at, that he served as a Hines County Sheriff's Deputy for three years prior to going to medical school, and it made sense. Then his diagnosis made sense to me, because when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Two minutes, ma'am. Thank you. I hope that seeing all the people who knew and loved Carly the best prior to March 19th, her friends, her maternal grandparents, her stepfather, her counselor. I hope seeing that they still love and support Carly Gregg after March 19th tells you everything you need to know about the incident that occurred on March 19th, that that wasn't Carly. Because if it was, why would the parents of those friends still let their daughter call Carly? Why would they be here testifying for her? And let's talk about this genius kid. The easiest story she could have told would have been, I shot my mom and stepdad because my stepdad had been molesting me for years. My mom knew about it and said nothing. And people would have bought it all day long. That's a convenient lie. And it would have served her all day long at the expense of her mom and her stepdad. That's the easier story to tell. But that's not what Carly said. Carly told the hard truth about her mental health issues. A truth that these are rare and it's happening, but that this happens often when you put kids on the wrong medication, when they already have these underlying significant mental health disorders and they get treated with the wrong medication, this is what can happen. I hope none of us are ever judged by the worst moments of our life, but rather by our lives as a whole. And I think when you step back and you look at the facts of this case as a whole, and when you look at the facts of this case as a whole and the picture of who Carly Gregg is as a person on a whole, you will see that this was not a bad kid. This was not a kid who was enraged. This was not a kid who had hatred in her heart for her mother or her stepfather. In fact, the exact opposite. This was a kid who was experiencing significant mental health issues, the same mental health issues that ran in her family and that we know are hereditary. This is the kid who was compliant with the medication she was put on However, that medication, without anyone being able to tell beforehand, caused her symptoms to worsen. And while she was having a state of psychosis and an episode of acute stress on March 19th, she lost herself in what was the perfect storm. I am asking you for those reasons to please find Carly Gregg not guilty by reason of insanity 
and finally quell this storm for Carly and her family. No one will understand this case and no one has heard this case the way that you have. And passing judgment on another person is a heavy burden to bear and I'm sorry that it falls on you. But please consider what is at stake in this case for this child and this family before you rush to judgment and render your verdict. Look at those documents, consider the testimony, search your heart for what you know about this child from the picture painted by her of all the people that knew her best. And you tell me, what was the intent? You tell me why someone who intended and had planned to murder someone wouldn't have taken the camera she knew was in the kitchen and was easy to see down before she did anything especially when she was a genius. I mean, that's not the actions of a diabolical evil genius leaving camera footage up for everyone to see, crawling through a sewer instead of just running away, calling friends for help, friends who could later testify about what happened. Again, I ask you to search your hearts and remember the undisputed truths in this case. Thank you. What is it, girl? What is it, girl? Mr. Camp, 17 minutes. Thank you. We'll start the clock until you have everything set up and you're ready. Oh, they split it up. Okay, before he gets started, I know y'all hear my cat, Sophie. She's uh, she's ready to have her lunch. Um, wow. <sighs> that wasn't a very good... I don't... Again, she... It's, she tried to discredit Pickett. Over his experience. Discredit Pickett over Dr. Harding. That he didn't remember three different medications. Now remember when the prosecution got back up. Or no, I think it was still on cross. With the defense with, with Pickett discussing Dr. Hardy. What stood out to me is when Pickett said, well, these, he goes, well, why didn't you, the defense is asking him, well, why didn't you bring up these other meds? And then he's like, well, I can't remember everything or whatever. And he says, well, and then he names off these meds. And then Dr. Pickett goes, oh, well, those meds are given to people who are irate and angry and, and carrying on. That they're given this to calm them down. Not necessary, even though they're psychotic drugs, but it wasn't necessary for... For because he's what she just insinuated her dad may have be schizophrenic. I think Pickett's testimony was powerful when he said that Dr. Hardy didn't take the time to consider because the bio dad wasn't forthcoming in his drug abuse over a decade of drug abuse. And how Pickett knew this is from testimony, from videotapes, from even from Ashley's journal. That her ex, the bio dad, was abusing drugs for years. And, and then Pickett said that this could Make a mixed diagnosis. If he's not forthcoming to Hardy about, of course, he didn't come up and say, yeah, I'm taking mushrooms and Coke and PCP and LSD. I mean, this guy took everything. Y'all heard about his text messages about Obama and making stuff legal and all this craziness. This guy abused drugs. And then, because I guess his years of abusing drugs, he was abusing Ashley and abusing Carly. <laughs> now, again, I think Pickett's testimony was crucial in um, clarifying that. 
because he only saw him three different times in an hour. So I don't think that. And then they're using the Mez, Mez defense and, and her bringing up, well, if Carly was so Carly's so smart. Now, this, I think, a lot of this, I think, is backfiring. If Carly's so smart, she didn't know to get rid of the camera before she committed the murder. But yet, you're going to let make us believe, because she, she took the camera after. Maybe she thought she had time to destroy it. I'm just assuming. But she's so smart, she didn't take the camera down, but she certainly was aware of the camera because she was hiding the weapon. That stands out to me, so I, I don't know if the jury's buying it. And the memory loss from the stepdad, I don't think it was established beyond a reasonable doubt that he said back in 2023 that she was having some uh, lapses in memory. From what I understand, he said when he was testifying to that, he was saying something to the effect, well, it was unusual she had to put stuff on the calendar. Why is the stepdad still staying with him and the grandparents should show signs of, you know, they're standing by her. They're pointing that out. The defense is, of course, they probably have to. I think it's weird that they're standing by her. I I honestly do. Would the grandparents or the stepdads would want Carly to come live with them? Any rational person. Think about it. Would you want her... If your family member murdered somebody and they're saying she has all these disorders, you would want her put away and, and, and got help. Probably forever. You wouldn't want her in the in the room down the hall sleeping white in your household. That is a them saying them standing by her, I guess that's fine and good. But at the end of the day, you're not going to, would you want her to live with you? That's my opinion. They talked about meds. They're discrediting Pickett and about the blackouts. Talking about Dr. Clark. I mean, this is just, wants to declare her insane at the moment. To brought up her sleeping, her intrusive thoughts. Carly had intrusive thoughts. Car- Carly had sleeping problems. Carly had... They're trying to tell the jury that Carly had all of these problems. But remember, Pickett said Carly didn't disclose 99.9% of this stuff until after the murder. But she was hearing voices since she was six. I think the defense has, well, this guy's fixing to get back on, but I don't think uh, Miss Todd has conquered any of that. Has conquered any of that. She's saying the bio dad, she was scared of the bio dad. Well, she probably was uncomfortable around him because he's, a, he's on drugs and he's a goofball. And that bringing up that her, she said bringing up the dad might have had schizophrenia, which that never came up in testimony. I only heard about uh, him being a drug abuser and that he is uh, bipolar. Uh, she, and then Miss Todd brought up the voices that she, she actually, Carly confided in one of her best friends. Two instances we know about voices. She told her friend, and she wrote it in her diary. That's it. So from age six to the incident, in between there, in between age six and 14, she only said two documentations of evidence that we have that Carly has voices. I'm sure the jury is going to remember that because it. I remembered it, and I am not the sharpest tool in the shed. And they talked about meds, but to me, the meds for Carly was for depression. It wasn't for voices. All right. And her bringing up Carly, Carly's mom snapped at her. Wow. That really upset Carly. I think that's hurt them. Because just because her mother snapped at her doesn't mean that Carly should have went and killed her. All right, 
that's my take on so far of the defense, this half of the defense. Uh, man, I, I don't think she's convinced me at all. At all. And I'm sure the jury's remembering what Pickett said about Miss Todd. That she was leading Carly in the evaluation. Clark never mentioned Miss Todd uh, leading her, but they were asking questions. And now in my brain, I'm thinking back that the prosecution asked Clark, is it usual for the, an attorney to be in the room? He said, well, it's not completely unusual, but, you know, sometimes. And the same with Pickett. The same with Pickett. Is it usual for the attorney to be coming in there? He said a lot of times he knows that they're there, out there, but, you know, he's usually uh, interviewing these people one-on-one. But <laughs> keep that in mind, people. Pickett said that in his, and he wrote it in his notes. She was leading Carly. All right, let's see what the other guy has to say in Carly's defense. It's so weird, the grandparents. I'm, I'm sorry, it's just... It's just, I mean, if it was my family member that murdered somebody, yeah, I'd still love them, probably still talk to them if they were in prison or in the state hospital, but they certainly wouldn't, I wouldn't want them out. May I please the court? Yes. Okay, we've been doing this since Monday, so I know y'all are probably as tired as I am. Um, this has always this is was always going to be a very difficult case and it's going to be difficult uh because the issues that we're dealing with is difficult uh, because it's we're in a, a very we're in part of a a realm of of the law and everything where you've been hearing a case all week and the defendant has basically said she's guilty and so there's not an issue of guilt in this case as we said from the from the get-go this is not a who did it case this is why it happened okay what's going on that's what you have to make the determinations is what's going on in Carly's mind as all this stuff is happening and that's the difficult part because you don't get to just look at the uh, video and say she did it because that's most cases that's what you're doing and it's an easy decision because you're looking at it and you simply see who did what how they did it and that's it now in this case because we're dealing with her mental state we're having to get inside her mind and understand what's going on and how that's all working and that's what this case has always been about from the get-go it's never been about who did it. One of the things that I wanted to talk with you just a little bit about is you had, in this case, you had three psychiatrists, or excuse me, one psychologist, two psychiatrists. Um, and both of the psychiatrists were forensic psychiatrists. And the psychologist was a forensic psychologist. And you had the two psychiatrists gave very different opinions, very different opinions. And some of the things that I wanted to point out on that is you have one, one of the doctors, which is Dr. Pickett, it was his first time ever being qualified as an expert, first time testifying. He just got certified a year ago. And then you have an opinion of somebody who has even a higher degree, and that's Dr. Clark. And Dr. Clark is board certified in pediatric and adolescent psychiatry. 
which means he deals with kids. He deals with teenagers. He knows the nuances of how that works. If you, if you listen to Dr. Pickett, and Dr. Pickett was 100% correct on this, he can do evaluations on everybody. But the problem is he doesn't know the nuances of the kids and the adolescents. And we're dealing with an adolescent. Carla was 14 when this happened. She turned 15 in jail. As all of y'all know, things are changing in people's bodies at those ages. They're, they're, they're growing, they're, they're becoming adults. You have a lot of different things going on. All those things have to be taken into consideration when you're coming up with the decisions or when you're coming up with how to do an evaluation on, on a person. And that's why you need that specialized knowledge is to know what's going on in teenagers. Dr. Clark gave you a very precise reason of how this happened, why it happened. And he said it, he said it was a difficult case to look at. Dr. Pickett, he wanted to, well, he basically wanted to just pick Dr. Clark's uh, case or diagnosis part and say, couldn't happen. And one of the big issues with that was the diagnosis of Carly's father. And why that's important is one of the prongs, and I know you've heard psychiatric stuff all week and it sort of gets old, um, but one of the prongs in order to see if somebody, I guess, is bipolar, one of the big issues is has that person or does that person have a family history? And that's why that became a big issue. And you heard Dr. Pickett get up there and he, and he looked at Dr. Hardy's stuff and said, well, I'm going to change the diagnosis. So he said, I'm going to discount that, which takes one of the prongs away with, with one of the things you're looking at with Carly. The other stuff that he wanted to discount, and I thought this was interesting, is you just heard you're reminded about SJ or SK when she got up on the, the stand. And she said, yeah, Carly had been hearing voices. I knew about it. Carly said that. Dr. Pickett, you heard, you heard him on the stand. It's like, if you bring me credible evidence, you bring me something, I'll change my mind. But you had the friends say, oh, yeah, I mean, we've, we've talked about it. Comes out on cross-examination, not direct, which was interesting. Um, but it comes out. And then Dr. Pickett sits there and says, well, that's a friend, so I'm not gonna count that. Okay, there's a journal, okay? In the journal, Carly makes some notes about uh, that she's heard voices and stuff. I'm gonna discount that because I think that's her embellishing. All this stuff is, all the SJ's testimony, the uh, journal, all that stuff's happened before this situation took place on the 19th of March. And it's important because what you're seeing is what Dr. Clark said. There's probably an undiagnosed, or there was an undiagnosed situation going on. It happens for a lot of different reasons. You have an individual, Carly, who's not telling everything. We know that. We know a lot more now than we did before. You heard from Miss Kirk, and I thought Miss Kirk was one of the things that, that was very enlightening with what Miss Kirk said. She was having a difficult time getting anything out of Carly. She really wasn't opening up. And so finally, the last session, which happens to be right before this happens, she was able to 
open up a little bit with her and get some more information. And in Carly's journal, there's an entry in there that talks about she likes Miss Kirk and that she may bring her the journal and let her see some of the stuff. That was something that was interesting. The other part that Miss Kirk said, she had no idea. Nobody had any ideas that this was going to happen that there was a chance that this could happen. There were no clues, there was nothing. This is one thing I do agree 100% with Dr. Pickett on, and he said this was an unusual case. And the reason why it's such an unusual case, daughters don't go and shoot their mothers for no reason. Dr. Clark talked to you a little bit about it. It's like, well, usually you either have panic, and we saw from the video and everything, there's no panic. He also talked to you about that there was mental issues that were going on. They had started in January. She was getting treatment. We didn't know how bad they were, but she had started getting treatment. They were getting worse, as we can tell from, from different things now where we're looking in the, the journals and things of that nature. The other thing that's very interesting is that on the back end, once she was incarcerated and she was getting treatment, the correct treatment, she got better. And that's when she got the Selexa and the Abilify. And those medications were working. And it's sort of what you were just uh, told a second ago. You have to have a, a stabilizer. And that's what she needed was the stabilizer. It stopped the voices. It stopped what was going on. We go back to the 19th of March. And you see what occurred. There's no, there was, there's nothing, there's no reason why Carly should have gone and shot her, shot her mother. There's no reason. What's equally weird about this whole situation, and, you were, <coughs> and it was in the, the state's opening, they talked a little bit about it. She crossed her arms. Again, very bizarre uh, activity. She's singing to the dogs. And the most bizarre, the most bizarre thing that occurs is this. She wants to go after Heath. Why? There is no reason. She calls her friends over. Friends are fine. If, if she's some sort of psychopath wanting to uh, go shoot 500 people kind of person, if she's calling people over, those would be some of the people that she would, I guess, target. But no, what happens is she's, she's reaching out for help. She's in a mental health crisis. You heard, uh, you heard the video that, uh, or the audio, I guess, of Heath. When Heath was, uh, when he arrived home, opens the door and gets shot at. He took the stand. He tells you to this day, that wasn't Carly. The person that was shooting at him was not Carly. It's real important. He's the last person that's seeing her right there as it's happening. This is the person who knows. This is the person that sees her every day, that knows Carly. And yet, he's saying, she's shooting at him. If, if there's anybody that has a reason to, you know, disavow uh, Carly and say, hey, look, I don't, she shot me. I don't want to have anything to do. She killed my wife. He's sitting there saying, and he was doing it to his own detriment, and he's saying, 
that's not her. Something's wrong. That was not her. And that's what he was trying to convey to you. Now, the next thing we have, can I play the video real quick? Will you help me with that? We have the video from Hines County Sheriff Officer or Deputy, Deputy Chad. And we played it. And if you remember the last thing that he says before, I guess it would help if you have the, the last thing, and we put it to, move it up a little bit. The last thing that he says before he mutes his body cam, listen to what it is. He says something to the effect that she doesn't know about her mother. And before we go back and listen, remember what Shaq said, why he was muting it. He said it was a personnel issue. If she doesn't know about her mother, that she is shot and all this stuff that's gone on, she doesn't know what's going on. That's why that's important. And I want you to listen to it. You're gonna be able to take this back and see and hear this, this video again. There's a policy, and I put the policy in evidence, just so everybody's clear. They cannot do what Shaq did. They cannot mute it. They don't have, uh, yeah, you can go ahead. We're gonna watch it. How much? Okay, go ahead and stop it. I'm running out of time, so y'all will have to look at it. But this is, when you go back in the jury room, you have some decisions to make. And these are the decisions that you have to address. You can find her guilty. You can find her not guilty. And when you, if you find her not guilty, you have to, you have two different options. It says not guilty beyond reason of insanity. And then you have to see if she has been restored to reason. If she has, then she's finished at, at this court. The other option, and this is what you have to look at, is you can find her not guilty by reason of insanity and that she has not been restored uh, and that she's a danger to, to the community. And what that means is she goes to the state hospital or somebody, comes, so she gets evaluated and they make the decisions on what happens to her. So when I'm telling you this, this is not, she has the keys and she's walking home. That's not, that's not what happens. We believe from all the testimony, and you can look on it here, you have the father saying it's not her, and then you have Shaq saying she doesn't know what happened. When you see those, that tells you she doesn't know what was going on at that time. We're asking you to find her not guilty by reason of insanity. And then you have to make the decision, was she restored or was she not? If she's not, she gets evaluated by the, the state hospital. They determine what's gonna happen to her. That's what we're asking for. We want you to find her not guilty by reason of insanity. I'm going to let this play with the, I kind of figured when the defense split up, I thought the, the prosecution's uh, closing was a little short, and then I realized, yeah, because, you know, I'm such an expert, that the, the prosecution probably split theirs up as well. Wow. What do you guys think? He was terrible. He was boring. Look, 
Uh, he's defending Carly. Okay, okay. Let, let, you know what? I'm going to say it. Perception is everything. This is important. Her life, her freedom, basically her freedom is on the line here. He was terrible. He was not, he didn't reel me in. Now, was the prosecution kind of, he wasn't, there wasn't, there wasn't sparks and passion flying, but he did a pretty good job of hitting some high points. He did okay. I wasn't completely bored with him. This guy, you know, I'm, I'm kind of lame in trying to describe how, you know, how I'm viewing each of these attorneys, but he was pathetic. This was terrible. He was lingering on and, and look. So again, he comes up and what is he doing? Attacking Pickett. Pickett's experience. And and then he goes over teens bodies changing. Now, I would hope to think that most people do have common sense. Most people remember when they were teenagers, or if a lot of people have teenagers in their home. Girls do have mood swings. Girls do, especially when they're going through puberty. So he goes over, keep in mind that teens going through changes in body. So this is also another reason why she murdered somebody. And then him talking about, well, he, she called her friends over. She didn't go on a rampage and murder them. No, because she had a plan. Her plan was to kill her mother and kill her stepfather. She had a plan. She told her friend she had a plan. So no, she wasn't on a, ran, a, a ravenous rampage. Okay, we can all surmise that. But he, but this this attorney brought this up, and then bringing up the bio dad discredit, trying to discredit Pickett on Pickett. Oh, Pickett just uh, saw that and said, "Oh yeah, we're just going to dismiss that. And I'm going to uh, diagnose him." Pickett never diagnosed the the bio dad. He just said Harding didn't take the time he probably should have. Because Pickett said he went back a decade and found out more stuff because he needs more information because not all patients are forthcoming. So with evidence, Ashley's journal, a, a decade of drug abuse, he said Harding didn't have the time or didn't take the time to properly evaluate the bio dad. And I'm sure, I, I always say I'm not the smartest tool in the shed, but I am sure the jury remembers that. And it is a lot of information that they've had to absorb over the past few days. Now, this video does say sentencing twisted teen murder trial day five. So, damn, I, man, if they've come up with a verdict this quickly, like I said in the last video, they've done made, they made up their minds probably during Pickett's testimony. Or they could have right out the gate seeing the video. And then had a bias the whole time once they saw the video because it's probably natural. But I know their instructions are that they're not. They're supposed to take in all the information. And plus when they were having the, the, the forensic psychiatrists come on and stuff and they, they were probably listening. If there was more evidence that Carly is this, this uh, person who is a schizophrenic, and blacks out because she has loss of time, then they would have, I'm sure they would consider it. But to me, there's no evidence showing that she has these things. To me, my little pea brain so far in the trial. And I'm just going to, I'm going to let this play here. But just evaluating this guy, 
uh, that just got done with his closing arguments was was terrible. It was terrible. Just more attacks on Pickett, teen bodies changing. <sighs> He's going to hang this on. I put into evidence, y'all can see back, that we put in the dr- jury instructions about body cam uh, guidelines and laws. I, you know what? After after all that, when I when I knew the defense was going for that earlier on in the case, I was like, "Who cares?" I thought I didn't care if he turned it off or not. We had already had enough. We had enough evidence at that point going along in the case that who, nobody cares if he turned it off right then and there, because you were trying to say the defense. She's schizophrenic. She blacked out. She didn't know what she was doing. You still could not overcome Pickett saying she said all this after the fact, which to me is huge. It's huge dealing with the psychiatrist. Okay, here comes the prosecution to finish up the closing. I think he said she had like 10 minutes or so. Let's see if she hammers it home. Yes, ma'am. I have some here to do you would just return them up here to the exhibit table, please, sir. Yes, sir. Restroom break? Right. I would love that. All right. Uh, yeah, if y'all don't mind, we'll sort those out. In the if y'all have a seat for just a second, we'll sort out the, uh, the exhibits. ...by the state. May I proceed, Joan? Yes, ma'am. Let me pick up right where Mr. Camp left off, ladies and gentlemen. What he was telling you is that if you find the defendant not guilty by reason of insanity and you decide that she's been restored to competency, <coughs> she'll walk out the door of this courthouse. You heard about voices. Let me tell you whose voice I'm talking about today. Ashley Smiley. Ashley Smiley's voice matters. Because of Carly Gregg's actions, we will never hear Ashley Gregg's voice again. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard the very last noise she made. Carly Gregg, her daughter, took a gun, walked across the house, pulled it out on her mother, fired once, you hear her mother scream. Fired twice, you hear her mother scream. One, two, three, four. You hear the third shot, ladies and gentlemen. You saw that awful picture. You saw the stippling. You saw what she did. That person has not been restored. That person was never insane to begin with. You know what you didn't hear the defense attorneys talk about? The insanity standard. You know why you don't want to talk about the standard? Because they can't prove it. They can't prove it, ladies and gentlemen. You know what they tried to stand up here and say? The state hasn't told you why. Ladies and gentlemen, when we talk during Vore Dyer, what do we talk about? That's not the state's burden. You won't find one place in the jury instructions that it tells you that the state of Mississippi has the burden to show you why Carly Gregg killed her mother, to show you why Carly Gregg attempted to kill Heath Smiley, to show you why Carly Gregg removed that camera that caught her actions and hid it into the refrigerator. That's not our burden. Our burden is to show beyond a reasonable doubt that she did it. And the defense attorneys have admitted that she did it. Let's talk about who needed help. Ms. Todd wanted to talk about Ms. Gregg needed help. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you that the two people that were begging for help was Ashley Smiley and Heath Smiley. We heard the 911 call. He says, oh my God, she's killed her mother and she tried to kill me. He says on there, please help, send me help. He tried to say that, oh, now maybe Carly didn't mean to kill me. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know why he's saying that, but I know that she shot him six inches from his head. And I know that she told Brooke Wafer, her friend, that I put three in my mom and I got three more waiting for my stepdad. You think that sounds like an insane person? No, that's a person that knew this gun right here. This 357 Magnum had seven rounds. That's a person that knew that she'd put three of them in her mama's head. She had three more waiting for Heath and who knows what she was doing with the last one. The why doesn't matter. 
They want to talk about the doctors. Dr. Pickett this, Dr. Clark that. Y'all heard him. Dr. Pickett said, yes, this is the first time I've had to testify in a criminal trial. But I have evaluated over 100 people for competency and sanity. You heard from Dr. Gugliano when she took the witness stand that she's done hundreds, if not more, evaluations of sanity uh, and competency. Let me tell you what you heard from Dr. Clark. When the defense went to tender him as a forensic psychiatrist, he said, no, 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 that's not what I am. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. Did he render any opinions specific to children? No. Does his diagnosis of Carly Gregg matter? No. When you look at the standard in the state of Mississippi to be able to prove insanity, all right, she has a mental illness, right? I think we can all agree that those records state that from the time she was a small girl until we sit here today, that she has anxiety and depression. Ladies and gentlemen, it is undisputed that anxiety and depression do not call someone to commit murder. It is undisputed in this courtroom that Kevin Gregg, if, if you believe his diagnoses, if you believe he was bipolar, schizophrenic, drug addict, all of it, does any of it matter? No, because you know what he didn't do? He didn't kill his parents. Ladies and gentlemen, the diagnosis doesn't matter. You heard, and, and I made notes of it, when Dr. Clark was testifying, Michael Smith was asking him, did she know right from wrong? That's what we gotta know, did she know <coughs> right from wrong? He says, well, she knew something about what happened. Okay, well, she knew. Then he goes further and he said, there was some level of awareness about what she was doing. Let's talk about that, ladies and gentlemen. She knew where she was. She knew who to call. She knew her mom's passcode. She knew where the loaded weapon was. You have pictures and evidence. There were other guns at the house. She didn't go pick up that unloaded shotgun and take it in there to where mama was, no. She went in there with that 357 Magnum that she knew was fully loaded. She knew to text her friends. She knew to FaceTime her friends. She called them by the right name. She called them by their nicknames. She said, I fucked up. She said, don't call, the, don't call 911. You know why, ladies and gentlemen? She wasn't done with her plan. We don't have to prove why she wanted to kill Heath Smiley. All we know is she did. All we know is that after she killed her mom at 4.14 in the afternoon, she lied in wait, sent a message to her stepdad saying, hey honey, when will you be home? She knew not to do it from her phone. She did it from mom's phone. When will you be home? Cause I'm waiting for you. Sends him a thumbs up. Then when he comes in the door, what's she do? Points the gun at his head, ladies and gentlemen. She knew exactly what she wanted to do. And then, when she wasn't sure if she was successful, she ran. Insane people do not run because they don't know right from wrong. Insane people do not tell people, I need help, because they don't think they've done anything wrong. Insane people do not flee the scene. Again, they do not know right from wrong. Carly Gregg knew everything she was doing that day. What Dr. Clark said from the witness stand is that he wants you, basically he wants you to put all your common sense aside. There's a whole stack of medical records. He says, you know, I didn't really pay much attention to the medical records. Not any of those other providers that actually treated Carly that said there was, there was no mention of voices, there was, there was no mention of lapses in time, these disassociations, but you know what I'm gonna rely on? Oh wait, no, I also didn't look at the text messages. I didn't think it was important to know what the defendant was doing at the time of the crime and between when she killed her mom and when she attempted to kill her dad. That wasn't that important. You know what's important? What the defendant said after she's been arrested for violent crimes. That's what he relied on, ladies and gentlemen. He said, well, Carly said that there were voices before. Pretty convenient, right? We talked in Bore Dyer on Monday about why do people lie? Why do people lie? Protection. Dr. Clark said on the stand, Lexapro doesn't cause murder. Lexapro might cause people to be more prone to suicide. Lexapro does not cause people to murder. Dr. Clark said on the stand that disassociation, that's what Carly had, right? That's what he diagnosed her with. But he couldn't say that disassociation causes people to commit murders. In fact, what he said was that people tend to disassociate when they are experiencing trauma. Let's think about that. 
common sense tells you if someone's in a disassociated state, they don't know what's going on, it's because they are on the receiving end of the violence. They're sex trafficking victims. They're prisoners of war. They're not children that are mad at their parents because they found out about their secret life. He expects us to believe that we can take the word of the defendant who has never reported, even to Rebecca Kirk, who she said she loved and trusted. She never reported voices to Rebecca Kirk. She never reported these lapses in time. In fact, you didn't hear that from any provider that's ever seen Carly. Let's take another step. Then, Carly doesn't stop there, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> she tells Dr. Pickett, oh yeah, I was still having one of these moments. So let's talk about, she's safe? Heck no, ladies and gentlemen. She's claiming that she's still having those moments while she's in our courtroom. During one of our hearings, she's saying she was in one of these disassociated spells. During her evaluation with Dr. Clark, she reported that she was having one of these disassociated spells. During her evaluation with Dr. Pickett, she was claiming she was having a disassociated spell. But you know what? She remembered every bit of it. I find it interesting that she told Dr. Clark that she has nightmares. She hears gunshots. You don't hear gunshots if you don't remember them. You don't have PTSD from an event that you don't recall. She told Dr. Guglielmo that she gets queasy. She gets sick to her stomach when she thinks about what happened that night. I would too. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we've seen the pictures. We know what she did. That's not the face of someone who's insane. We don't have to prove the why. When Dr. Guglielmo asked her, Carly, what's bothering you the most right now? She said, I always ask patients that when I'm evaluating them. Carly said, I'm missing school. Think about that. Not, I miss my mom. I'm so sorry that I did this. Oh, I hate what I've done to my family. I'm missing school. I asked Ben at Germany when he took the stand, you and Carly are still great friends, right? He said, best friends. Y'all talk all the time? Yeah, all the time, even now that she's in jail. I said, Bennett, on any of your calls, any call, has Carly expressed remorse for what she has done? He took that stand and he said, no. I want to talk about Bennett too. He, he said, while well, I was asking him a question at some point, he said, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I zoned out. Ladies and gentlemen, we've all had a moment where we've zoned out. We've all had a moment where we've driven down the road and got there and thought, how did I get here? I don't remember, but I knew I drew, drove here. I tell you, when I have those moments, I'm not insane. I know exactly how I got there because I was the one driving the car. I know right from wrong, and Carly knew right from wrong that day. There is no record, no medical record of Carly hearing voices before this. I want to talk to you about some of the things, some of Carly's actions. Let's talk about some of her will for actions. First of all, I want to show you these two. Let's not forget this. These were recovered from inside Ashley Smiley's brain and neck. Who put them there? Carly Gregg. Mm. Carly Gregg's willful actions. Let's talk about that. We talked about she knew where her house was. We talked about she knew that her mom was upset with her. She told Dr. Pickett, yeah, my mom was very upset. The defense wanted you to believe that everything was hunky-dory that day. It wasn't. We've seen the videos. She may not have been yelling, but she sure was upset. We know that Carly knew her mom's password. We know that she intentionally pulled the trigger not once, not twice, but three times, shot her in the head. We know that she called her friends over. We know that she told them don't call the police. We know that she wouldn't let them know what was going on. We know that the that she tells Brooke, right? Let's talk about the tampering with evidence. She tells Brooke when she comes in the house, when the first thing she asks is, are you queasy around dead bodies? Ladies and gentlemen, use your common sense. What does that mean? I know if I'm asking somebody that, it's because there's a dead body. She knew that she had killed her mom. She tells Brooke, I got three waiting for my stepdad. She knew that she was going to shoot her stepdad. She also tells Brooke something important. Oh, don't worry. I pulled the cameras down already. I pulled the cameras down. 
She knew enough to rip that camera off of where it was, hide it in the refrigerator. Was it a perfect plan? No. Nobody ever said our plan was perfect. That's why we're here. But ladies and gentlemen, that's not insanity. That's not insanity. I want to talk about Deputy Shack and his interaction. Mr. Camp said, oh yeah, he, he's saying she doesn't even know about her mother. We heard from Deputy Shack. He took the stand. He said she never asked about her mother. Ladies and gentlemen, you know the only person she asked about in her interaction with law enforcement? How's Heath? You know why? Because the only thing Carly Gregg didn't know from that day was whether or not she was successful in killing Heath Smiley. Mm. That's the only thing she didn't know. Again, the defense wanted to talk about it's the highest burden of proof. We have the highest burden of proof in criminal law. The state of Mississippi has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Carly Gregg intended to kill her mother and did kill her. We have done that. They don't dispute that. We have to prove that Carly Gregg intended to kill Heath Smiley and was unsuccessful. They don't dispute that. We have to prove that Carly Gregg intended to remove evidence and hide it. We've already proved that. They don't dispute that. The only thing that the defense wants you to do is to have sympathy for the defendant, to believe this story that she's made up after she's been arrested. Dr. Clark talked about that on the stand, right? He admitted that there's research out there that, that shows that there is a large population of people that claim disassociation after they have committed homicide. And we asked him, why? Secondary gain. What's secondary gain? So I don't get in trouble. Pretty convenient. If I don't remember what happened, I was having an out-of-body experience, maybe they can't Maybe they can't get on to me. Ladies and gentlemen, don't fall for that. That does not make sense. I want to talk about some of Carly's journals and some of the text messages. The text messages are in evidence, the ones that she sent to her friends between the time she killed her mom and when she attempted to kill her stepdad. One of them's not, but Thad testified from the witness stand that after he showed up at her parents' house, he and Carly were having a discussion and Carly said, oh yeah, my mom was holding me down in the chair. She wouldn't let me come out there. And then she texts him later and, and says, I almost murdered my parents. She was so mad in February that she tells Thad, I almost murdered my parents. And then when I asked Heath about it, when he took the stand, he said, no, Carly, Carly wasn't mad. Carly never was angry. He says, Carly never yelled. Ladies and gentlemen, she told us in February what she was going to do. I want you to look at her journals. There's a page back there that says, what do I believe? There's no God. Heaven and hell are false. You write your own, writing your own destiny. And these two stand out to me, ladies and gentlemen. She told us what her intent was. You don't need family and it's okay to be evil. There's another one I want you to look at. Dr. Pickett talked about it. She wrote, water, fire, earth. Water, fire, earth. She circles fire, ladies and gentlemen. And she wrote, these are Carly Gregg's own words. Ms. Todd stated when we got started the other day, what's better, watching a video of what happened or hearing somebody talk about it? Well, I submit to you, we have all of the above in this case. We got to, unfortunately, watch a video of what happened. We've seen photos of what happened. We have audio of what happened. We have the defendant's journals and text messages telling us what happened. She says, I choose fire. It is powerful, beautiful, and deadly. These are the traits I desire, so I choose fire. Ladies and gentlemen, that lady right there chose fire. She chose to murder her mother, tried to kill her stepdad, and then tried to cover it up. We ask that when you go back to the jury room, that you'll look at all the evidence, that you'll consider the testimony that you've heard, that you will not be misled or confused by the fact that the defendant tries to put a burden on the state that does not exist. We do not have to prove the why. 
We will likely never know the why, but we know that Carly Gregg is guilty of murder, attempted murder, and tampering with physical evidence, and we ask you to find the same. Thank you. All right. I need Mr. Don Bass and Mr. Philip Hunt to stand, please. Apologize, gentlemen. I've watched y'all. Y'all are paid a lot of attention, but y'all are the alternates. At this time, I'm going to ask Madam Bailiff to escort them to the other courtroom if it's open or the other jury room if it's open. Please gather your things out of the jury room, though. Once the bailiffs let me know that uh, the alternates have been separated, I'll release you to begin your deliberations. Please do not begin your deliberations until you receive the instructions of the court and all the evidence. Many times jurors find it helpful to pick a four-person from among their group. Four-person has no more power than any other person. Highest qualification is you should be able to write legibly so we can read any verdict, okay? Second thing a four-person can do is call for a vote. Many times disagreements can be resolved by simply calling for a vote and finding out where everybody stands. All right. That being said, uh, let me know once they're separated. Did everybody fill out a, a lunch menu too? Okay. Right. They're separated. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you, you can retire to begin your deliberations. God. All right, the record will reflect we're outside the presence of the jury. Um, I'm going to ask both sides to make sure Mr. Shipley here has a cell phone number where you can be reached, both sets of attorneys. Uh, within 10 minutes of the jury reaching a verdict, I expect y'all back in the courtroom ready to go either way, okay? Um, I want y'all to get together. Make sure all the exhibits are together, are present and accounted for, and that any uh, exhibits marked for identification are separated. All right, we'll remain in recess until such time as the jury reaches the verdict. Oh my God, that was the passion, that was the fury, that was grabbing. She grabbed me right out the gate. That was good. That was good. That is what we needed from all of them. From the defense. No. They saved... The prosecution did good. They saved the best for last. Because that was... Wow. Come on, guys. Y'all have to admit... That closing argument was, was fire. That was passion. That was every word, everything. And her bringing up all of that stuff, hitting what Dr. Pickett said, not taking stock into Clark. She didn't say all of this stuff until after the murder. She was just nailing everything. It was, and then her grabbing the gun. Her talking about Carly being knowledgeable, Carly, the text messages. I didn't see the uh, the photos, which I probably don't want to anyway. I didn't see the photos that they showed of her mother. Um, I don't know, but that that's okay. That's okay. I don't need to see that. We know we know her mom is dead. It's a just a damn shame. Wow! And then Carly started to cry. Did y'all see that? She started to get upset. The prosecution. That lady. Pointing the finger at her. Man. That was so good. That was so good. Oh my God. I'm thinking they are. Look at this. This is. 
It's still got like three hours left. I don't know how long they're in deliberation, but I will stop it um, until it gets to that. And I will, yeah, I well, it'll be abracadabra for y'all, but I will add it to this one because it's not that long. We might as well put it all on one video. It looks like it's just going to wrap it up. I mean, good Lord. Gosh, that was, that was so good. That, I love that. I love when a prosecution or a defense attorney gets up there with passion and just rambles out all the evidence. It was so incredibly good. Wow. Wow. And that's the impression that the, uh, the jury got the last to hear. And you know what? It's looking like they didn't take that long to deliberate. Maybe they're going to have lunch and all that good stuff. All right, here comes the stepdads coming in. Um, we're waiting for everybody. I, looking at the time stamp on here, when I fast forward, now this is I fast forwarded it till it just started. The audio hasn't come on yet. Um, what is it looking like? They deliberated for two hours. It probably just took them that long to fill out the paperwork. I'm just guessing, people. They knew already. I, this is quick. Not that I'm a, like a court expert, but wow. To life in prison? Or she's insane? And when the prosecution came out and said, if you say she was insane, she gets to walk out that door today. I was blown away when she said that. I didn't know it would be that quick if she was found insane. I thought it would be where maybe she'd have to go and and the state would see what needs to be done with her or monitor. I don't know. There's the goofy stepdad. Wow. He's standing by her side. Why is she upset? And how come we don't have audio? And no sound. Okay, so the, the, the... They're saying there's no volume in the chat. What's going on here? She, why is she getting upset? Oh, man. She's scared and freaking out. Just reading some of the chat. Maybe the uh, the jury's not in yet. Yeah, she should be scared. If she's as smart as everybody's saying, and she is so smart, she should know. This was compelling evidence against her. Wow, come on, where's the, where is the sound? Oh, hold up, my cat wants out of my room. What is going on with the sound? Oh, she is. Look at her. And now here comes the flood of tears. Yeah, she. And what, what was she saying? She texted her friends. Yeah, I effed up. She knew what she was doing. If you were blacked out and didn't know what you were doing, how do you know you effed up? I don't know. Just asking questions, but. They're still saying sound quality sounds off. I don't know what's going on. 
Oh, maybe they're just waiting for more family members to come because they're, I don't know who that lady is. I don't see the grandparent. There, that looks like it would be Ashley's sister. Because look at her. She kind of looks like Ashley. I'm assuming, people, that that's Ashley's sister. I would be forgiving, but I wouldn't want her out if she killed one of my siblings. If another family member killed one of my siblings. Just saying. I don't, I don't think so. Well, she's, uh, man, it's been like four and a half minutes. What is going on? Oh, I didn't see the, uh, the grandparents. Maybe they're waiting for them. I don't know. I think he said he gave them 10 minutes so to, for them to be notified and then them all to come come back in there. And people are questioning why she's crying. Well, she's 15 years old and she's a dumbass and she's scared to death. Oh, here we go. Here we go. All right, please be seated. All right. The court's been informed that the jury's reached a verdict. I say this in every case. One half of this room, I don't know which half, is going to be upset. Do not add insult, injury to insult. If you, these people did not ask for this job. They didn't want the job. The state and the defense forced them into the job. You will not approve the jury's verdict and you will not disapprove of the jury's verdict, or you will go to jail. It is a 30-day jail sentence for every outburst. I'm going to give anyone who does not believe that they are able to control their emotions the opportunity to leave the courtroom at this time. Would anybody like to leave? All right, Mr. Bailiff, please bring in the jury. There's not that very many people in the gallery. When they when the camera packed, pan, packed, panned around, there wasn't that many people in there. I would have thought that place would have been packed with reporters and spectators. Man, she don't know what's the bomb's fixing to drop. Now, I haven't seen this, so I, I don't know. I don't even know if they convicted her on all the counts. He is so weird. The, the, the parents, grandparents, and him—it just—it's just odd, 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 odd. Can you sit right there, ma'am? Ma'am, I see you're holding some papers. The jury been able to reach a verdict in, the, in any of these counts. Yes, ma'am. All right, if you would please hand the paper to the bailiff. Greg, please rise and come to the podium, along with your attorneys. All right, the verdicts appear to be in proper form. Verdict of the jury is count one. We, the jury, find the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, guilty of first-degree murder as charged in the indictment. Count two. We, the jury, find the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, guilty of attempted murder as charged in the indictment. Count three. We, the jury, find the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, guilty of tampering with evidence as charged in the indictment. Please be seated, Ms. Gregg. Ladies and gentlemen, the jury is custom for the court to poll the jury. I have to do it each time. I'm not being, and for each count, I'm not being rude. The quickest way for me to get through this is to simply point at you and you answer out loud.
As to count one, we, the jury, find the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, guilty of first-degree murder as charged in the indictment. Beginning on the first row, ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. sir, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes. Sir, is that your verdict? Yes. Ma'am, is that your verdict? You got to answer out loud, ma'am. I'm sorry. Yes. On the back row, sir, is that your verdict? Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes. Sir, is that your verdict? Yes. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes. Ma'am, is that your verdict? That verdict is proper and, and unanimous. As to count two, we, the jury, find the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, guilty of attempted murder as charged in the indictment. Beginning on the first row, ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Sir, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes. Sir, is that your verdict? Yes. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes. On the back row, sir, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes. Sir, is that your verdict? Ma'am, is that your verdict? Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes. Ma'am, is that your verdict? As to count three, we, the jury, find the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, guilty of tampering with evidence as charged in the indictment. Beginning on the first row, ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. sir. is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. sir. is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. On the back row, sir, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. sir, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Ma'am, is that your verdict? All right. All three verdicts appear to be unanimous. The court will enroll the verdict. All right. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, with you having returned a verdict of guilty in count one and count two of the indictment, we'll now proceed to the sentencing phase of the trial. State of Mississippi may call its first witness. Here, the state has no witnesses. We would just ask that the court adopt the previous testimony that the jurors have heard. Uh, with the exception of we seek to introduce one photograph. All right. The state wishes to move move to adopt and incorporate by reference the record of the guilt phase. Is that correct? That's correct. Show your uh, piece of evidence to the other side. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. Y'all approach. Holy smokes. Well, we're not surprised. I mean, even if I hadn't already known she was found guilty, but I hadn't watched this intentionally, I didn't watch um, the day five. I started from day one and moved my way up. By picket, and that closing argument from the lady prosecutor was epic. It was good. It was compelling. It was fire. It was passion. It was what we like to see out of an attorney's closing arguments. Uh, I wasn't, I'm not surprised. The defense couldn't overcome Pickett, couldn't overcome the videos, couldn't justify the fact that you couldn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she, she was schizophrenic. She had blackouts. She had loss of time. She has out of body detachment. All of this stuff. I don't know what um how much I don't know how much time she gets. I'm assuming it, it was life, but I'm wondering if if he put a stipulation of parole. She's saying, we're going to appeal. We're going to appeal. Don't worry. You'll be in there 20 years before your appeal right, comes up. move to adopt and incorporate by reference the record of, of the guilt phase of the trial. The court will grant that request. Does the state have any other witnesses that wish to call? Yes, sir. All right. Defense may call any witnesses. <clears throat> they don't have... Who, who the hell are they going to call? Uh, we don't have any witnesses, Your Honor. All right. With the defense not calling any witnesses, attorneys approach. Does the defense rest its, ca its case in chief as to sentencing? We do. do you also move to adopt and incorporate by reference the record? We do. All right. Y'all approach. Who the hell would they call? They pulled out everything that they could. How much time is left in this? This still almost another hour left in this well what could her appeal be if she's gonna you know they're gonna try to appeal it but on what grounds 
again, I'm not an expert, but what what grounds would they use for an appeal? All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, with both sides agreeing to rely on the testimony from the guilt phase, the court will further instruct you at this time. You, the jury, have found the defendant guilty of the crime of first-degree murder in count one. You must now decide whether to impose either a, life, a sentence of life imprisonment in the custody of the Department of Corrections or life imprisonment in the custody of the Department of Corrections with the possibility of parole. The court instructs the jury that you should consider the following factors in making your decision. One, the defendant's chronological age. Two. The defendant's family, home, and environment. Three, the circumstances of the homicide offense. Four, the defendant's incompetencies, incompetencies associated with youth. And five, the defendant's possibility of rehabilitation. The court instructs the jury that when all 12 of you reach and agree upon the defendant's sentence for first degree murder, she, you shall return the sentence in one of the following forms. If you agree to sentence the defendant to life imprisonment in the custody of the Department of Corrections, your verdict will be as follows. Quote, count one. At, quote, as to count one, we the jury sentence the defendant, Carly Mass, and Greg to life imprisonment. Close quotes. If you agree to sentence the defendant to life imprisonment in the custody of the Department of Corrections with the possibility of parole, your verdict will read as follows. Quote, as to count one, we the jury sentence the defendant, Carly Mass, and Greg to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole. Close quote. If you cannot agree to the sentence for the defendant as to first degree murder, your verdict will be as follows. Quote, Quote, as to count one, we the jury are unable to affix the punishment. Close quote. You the jury, having have found the defendant guilty of the crime of attempted murder in count two, you must now decide whether to impose either a sentence of life imprisonment in the custody of the Department of Corrections or life imprisonment in the in the custody of the Department of Corrections with the possibility of parole. The court instructs the jury that you should consider the following factors in, ma in making your decision. One, the defendant's chronological age. Two, the defendant's family and home environment. Three, the circumstances of the homicide offense. Four, the defendant's incompetencies associated with youth. And five, the defendant's possibility of rehabilitation. The court instructs the jury that when all 12 of you reach and agree upon the defendant's sentence for attempted murder, you shall return the sentence in one of the following forms. If you agree to sentence the defendant to life imprisonment in the custody of the Department of Corrections, quote, as to count two, we the jury sentence the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, to life imprisonment. Close quote. If you agree to sentence the defendant to life imprisonment in the custody of the Department of Corrections with the possibility of parole, your verdict will read as follows. Quote, as to count two, we the jury sentence the defendant, Carly Madison Gregg, to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole. Close quote. If you cannot agree to the sentence for the defendant as to attempted murder, your verdict will read as follows. Quote, as to count two, we the jury are unable to affix the punishment. Close quotes. All right. First closing by the state as to sen as to sentencing. Mr. Bailiff, seven and a half minutes. You wish a two minute warning or a one minute warning? Uh, one minute is fine. One minute. You may proceed. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been here for five days now. Over five days, we've heard about this terrible crime that was committed by Carly Gray. You have to consider her chronological age. We can't change that. She's 15 years old. In the eyes of the law, we talked about this on Monday, Carly Gray is an adult. You do get to consider her age, but that's not the only factor you consider when you determine whether or not to send her uh, to prison for life. We'd ask that she be sent to prison for life without the possibility of parole, and let me tell you why. When you consider her family and home environment, ladies and gentlemen, by all accounts, the defendant has told you she had a loving home. She had parents that adored her. She had every opportunity, more opportunities than most kids. She was advanced in school. She had guitar lessons. They took her to equestrian therapy. They took her to counseling. She had the opportunity to have medication. Nothing was enough for her. She still committed these heinous crimes, nothing. Her home life was a perfect home life. When we talk about these factors in, in Miller, that usually comes up when we talk about these defendants that have been grown up on the streets when their parents weren't present. Now, 
Did Carly have a dad that she didn't love or had problems? Absolutely. But ladies and gentlemen, that is not enough. That is not enough for her to be able to walk the streets. She murdered someone. She attempted to murder her stepdad. Her family life and her dad being on drugs is not enough. The circumstances of the homicide, I don't have to tell you that. Y'all just lived it, you watched it, you saw those awful photographs. You had to watch that terrible video. We listened to Ashley Smiley's last sounds. We heard from Heath Smiley on that 911 call, the desperation. He said, help me, help me. Ladies and gentlemen, those crimes were awful. She has shown zero remorse, zero remorse for what she has done. Let's talk about her ability to, for rehabilitation. The defendant's own expert during the guilt phase of this trial said, you know, she's on this medicine, she's fine. But if you believed that, ladies and gentlemen, you would have believed that she was having some disassociated spell at the time of the crime and that she's continuing to have these disassociated spells. And, and obviously no one's buying that, right? We don't know why she committed these crimes, but we know she did. And we know that she is a danger to society. If she is given the possibility of parole, no one in this room knows how long she will stay there. We cannot guarantee she will stay there one year or 10 years. We have no control over that. Ladies and gentlemen, we watched one of the most heinous things that I believe most of you will ever see in your life. Please do not let this lady have the possibility of parole. If she were paroled, nothing would stop her from walking into a school. Nothing would stop her from walking into a shopping mall. Nothing would stop her from walking into the grocery stores. Nothing would stop her from being in the movie theaters. Ladies and gentlemen, she is dangerous. She may look like a little girl. They may have said she's sweet little Carly, but unfortunately we all know that that's not true. We will ask, and I will ask you again when we stand back before you, that you sentence Ms. Gregg to life in prison without the possibility of parole for both the murder of her mother, Ashley Smiley, and the attempted murder of her stepfather, Heath Smiley. Thank you. Damn. Damn. She's right. Argument says to sentencing by the defense. Who's to say she won't kill again? How much of a warning would you like, Mr. Camp? I have two minutes, Your Honor. Two minutes. Nobody could say. Fifteen minutes total. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm going to have to tell you, this is probably the most difficult thing I've ever had to do. Um, I respect your, your jurors, and I respect your verdict, and I totally understand that. And now I'm in front of you. Code Greg, when this happened, 14. She's 15 now. Does he get choked up? Sitting on the front row. Her grandparents, which are Ashley's mother and father, damn, have been supportive during this whole process. Which is creepy. He's smiling. He was the victim in this case. He has been supportive. This is a family that has been torn apart because of this. This is extremely, extremely difficult on, on all of them. And I know the state is up here saying that She's this heinous individual. And you've heard a lot of testimony that that's not who Carly is. You heard the, the, the counselors, Ms. Kirk. She couldn't believe it happened. Nobody knows why it happened. You have the opportunity 
to not make this worse on the family. You have three options. You can do life without parole, you can do life with parole, or you can let the judge make the determination. In this case, we would ask you, let the judge make the determination. Mm -hmm. We don't want you to give her a sentence for life in prison. Life in prison is life in prison. That's it. 14 year old. She can come out of this at some point. Anywhere you're here, she can walk out of here and We don't, first of all, we don't know. And usually it's a lot longer than that. I mean, a lot longer. So, don't. I don't want you to, you know, go back in that room and think, oh, if you come back and say she gets parole, that's not, that's, it's not a short sentence at all. We would ask you to allow the judge to make the sentence because the judge understands, I'm not saying y'all don't, I mean, you don't have any hey, ability to me. Don't uh, get me wrong on that. But he knows, and the court knows, what we're actually looking at with times. And so please, in this situation, please let the judge make the sentence in this case. She what? Damn. Final closing on behalf of the state. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kemp is right. We may never know the reason why Carly killed her mom and attempted to kill her stepdad. And for me, that's even scarier than knowing why. Because if we don't know why, what's to say it won't happen again? Damn. We don't know. It is terrible for the family. The family has my sympathies, absolutely. I cannot imagine what any of them have gone through. We talked in Ward Iyer about how sometimes uh, the, the victims cooperate with the prosecutor and the prosecution, and sometimes they don't. We don't always know why. But I know this, my office represents the citizens of Rankin County, and my office is asking you to please sentence Ms. Craig to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you've received the, uh, you've heard the arguments. I'm gonna ask you, I'll send you back the instructions. I'm gonna ask that you retire to begin your deliberations. Everyone remain seated while the jury exits. Holy smokes. The defense is terrible. That was like, well, let, please let the judge, because, you know, he knows best. Really? You said that to them? That was kind of condescending, I think. Like, they're dumbasses? I don't know, guys. That's, that's what I got. Like, no. We just sat through this case. Mr. Bell, they still have the verdicts, the uh, evidence. Yes, yes, sir. All right, if you would take those to them. All right, we'll be in recess till such time as the jury reaches its verdict regarding sentencing. Damn. All right. I fast forwarded a little bit. She's coming back in. Like I said, I can't always get pinpoint precise where to come in. So I thought her coming in, she's still crying. She's still upset. All right, the bailiffs inform me that the jury has a question. Oh, shit. Jury's question is, what is life in prison without parole? Question mark, years wise. Attorneys can approach. Look the note. It is life without possibility of parole? That means for until she dies? All right. Anybody need to review any further? No. All right. We'll mark the C next to number for ID purposes only. And what do you tell them? Ah. <clears throat> All right. Well, 
Well, the truth of the matter is that the truthful answer to that question is nobody knows. Um, however, uh, typically all the court can say is something to the effect of you have received all of the evidence and, and instructions in this case, please continue your deliberations. I'll hear arguments from the state as to response. No argument, Your Honor. By the defense. No argument, Your Honor. All right. I'm going to ask Ms. Butler or Ms. Eaton to uh, write that out. Y'all know my handwriting is bad. Dang, we still got a whole another 45 minutes. Well, they're thinking, well, if we give her life, what does that mean? Well, we know what parole means. I'm going to ask counsel for both sides to approach one more time, look at the note, make sure you agree that's what it says. Any objections by the state? No, sir. By the defense? No, Your Honor. All right. I'm going to ask Ms. Butler to make a copy of that. I'll mark the copy, see next to number for ID purposes only. The bailiff will take the original back to the jurors. The copy of the note will be marked C next to number, C4 for ID purposes only. Mr. Bailiff, you can take that note to the jury. We'll be in recess till the jury reaches a verdict. I don't know why she's smiling. Guys, I don't know if they give her parole or not. I, like I said, this is new to me. Dang. How much time is left? Gosh, not long. Ma'am, I see your I see your holding paper. Has the jury been able to reach a unanimous verdict? Yes, sir. Please hand that to the This was very quick for the jury to do this. Kinda. Like two hours and then a, maybe another what, forty five minutes they All right, the verdict appears to be in one, in proper form. Mr. Gregg, if you and your attorneys would come to the podium. The verdicts read as follows. As to count one, we the jury sentence the defendant Carly Mass and Greg to life imprisonment. As to count two, we the jury sentence the defendant Carly Mass and Greg to life imprisonment. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, just as I did with the verdicts of guilt, not trying to be rude. It's the quickest way we can get it done. As to count one, we the jury sentence the defendant Carly Mass and Greg to life imprisonment. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Sir, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. On the back row, sir, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Sir, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. sir, is that your verdict? So that means no parole? Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes. As to count two, we the jury sentenced the defendant, Carly Mass and Greg, to life imprisonment. On the front row, ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Sir, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Ma'am, is that your verdict? Ma'am, is that your verdict? On the back row, ma'am, is that your verdict? Does that mean two life sentences if she was got life for both? Ma'am, is that your verdict? Do they? Ma'am, is that your verdict? I don't know. Sir, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. sir, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Verdict appears to be in proper form. Ladies and gentlemen, the jury, please exit. I will be there in just a moment to release you, okay? Everyone remain seated while the jury exits.
No reaction and she just got life in prison? Wouldn't you think you'd be just trembling? Miss Greg, please come to the Oh. Your sentences will be as follows. As to count one, the jury having fixed the verdict at life imprisonment, this court will sentence you to life imprisonment. As to count two, you'll be sentenced to life imprisonment. As to count three, you'll be sentenced to 10 years to serve. You'll be required to pay court cost fees and assessments in the amount of? $431.50. Ms. Gray, regarding any appeal of your judgment of conviction and order of sentence and in accordance with Wright versus State 577, Southern 2nd 387, the court wants to inform you that pursuant to Rule 4E of the Mississippi Rules of Appellate Procedure, the notice of appeal required by Rule 3 of such rules shall be filed with the circuit clerk within 30 days after the date of the denial of any motion for a new trial or the date of imposition of sentence, whichever is later. Pursuant to Rule 4E, if you make a timely motion under the Mississippi Rules of Criminal Procedure for a judgment of acquittal notwithstanding the verdict of the jury or for a new trial under Rule 25.1, the time for appeal shall run from the entry of the order denying such motion. Finally, Rule 25.1 subsection C provides that a motion for a new trial must be made within 10 days of entry of the judgment, which includes both the adjudication of guilt and sentence. Should you make a decision on the record to appeal, that decision will stand unless a written statement to the contrary signed by you and your attorney is filed with the court. Should you make a decision to waive appeal, that decision will stand unless you give written notice to the court and your attorney prior to expiration of the time in which to perfect an appeal. Should no decision to appeal be made by you, your failure to express a desire to appeal shall be considered a waiver of your right to appeal, and that waiver will stand unless you give written notice to the court and to your attorney prior to expiration of the time in which to perfect an appeal. Have you made a decision to appeal your conviction and sentence? Well, we'll All right. The court will be in recess. Your Honor, I need clarification. I apologize. Sentences will run concurrent. <laughs> What's going on? Wow. I guess what my question is, is uh, she got life on the two, the first count and the second count. Does that mean, is that run consecutive? So that's two life sentences and the third count, she got 10 years? So she's never getting out. Unless there's, uh, they find some reason to appeal this, but, you know, my pea brain little mind is what would they have to grounds for an appeal? He let everything in. Uh, maybe they're going to say because they, he allowed some of the kids' names to be said, that, that has nothing to do with it. You remember how the the defense got and the, the 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 judge got pissed off at her and said they needed a a a pregnant pause a pregnancy pause I think that's the term he used when she said well you know the, I'm getting phone calls from the uh, parents of the of the two minor witnesses and he got pissed he said nobody cares about the the jury. What a ride, guys. A weak ride. And I'm not surprised of the verdict. No parole. Life with no parole. Uh, is anybody surprised? And look at him. I mean, this was just so, so weird. I guess they might make a movie of this, and they need to go have an interview. I haven't seen anything yet. I was waiting for it at the end of the trial. Maybe I'll go start looking to see if they have interviewed the grandparents. See, they're over there talking. What does this mean? She's never getting out. Are y'all going to appeal? Yeah. 
Carly's sister? Well, anyway, that concludes Carly was found guilty with, in life in prison with no parole. We'll see if uh, later on if there'll be some... Uh, I'd like to see them interview if that happens. They can interview the jurors. I'd like to know where they are at and how they were just boom. I think they went in there and took a vote and everybody said guilty. And then they took two hours to fill out the paperwork. That's my opinion. I don't know. Because this was pretty darn fast. Uh, how much longer is this? Another four minutes of, of nothing. I think it's just four minutes of nothing. Here we go. There it is. Carly. Guilty. Life in prison. No parole.